nobody likes to be Wally Pipped. Wally Pipp was the starting first baseman for the New York Yankees from 1915 to 1925. It was he, not his teammate Babe Ruth, who was the first Yankee to lead the American League in home runs. He topped the league in 1916 and 17. He was considered one of the best power hitters in the dead ball era. But that's not what Wally Pipp is remembered for. On June 2, 1925, Pip showed up at the Yankee Stadium with a severe headache, and he asked the trainer for two aspirin. Miller Huggins, who was the Yankees manager, overheard this and said, Wally, why don't you take the day off? We'll give this kid Lou Gehrig a chance at first base today. We'll get you back in there tomorrow. <clears throat> Lou Gehrig played so well that he played the next 2,130 games in a row. Wally Pipp never got back in the lineup in the New York Yankees uniform. He ended up playing a few more years for the Cincinnati Reds, but nobody really heard from him again. Years later, he was quoted to have said, I took the two most expensive aspirin in history. <laughs> and due to his famous replacement by Lou Gehrig, players began to say they were Wally Pipped when permanently replaced in the lineup, especially if it was due to a minor injury. Now, it wasn't a minor injury that caused a hole in Paul's missionary team. It was a major blow-up that we saw in our last study uh, that led to the split with his longtime associate Barnabas. On their first missionary journey, Barnabas and Paul had taken John Mark as their young assistant. I'm sure he proved very valuable to them as long as he was with them. He was there as they evangelized uh, the island of Cyprus, which was Barnabas's home area. But after they had gotten to Asia Minor and, and had some adversity, John Mark left them and went home. And that's something Paul did not forget. And a few years later, when Paul and Barnabas decided to go back and revisit those churches they had planted, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark along again, and Paul said, nothing doing. And they had a real contention with this. It was a real fight between these two, and they eventually ended going their separate ways. Barnabas took John Mark back to Cyprus, and Paul teamed up with Silas and headed to Galatia. I'm sure, though, there were times when Paul thought to himself, I could really use someone like John Mark about now. <clears throat> And we find in these opening verses of Acts chapter 16 that he would find such a replacement. Now according to the last verse of Acts 15, Paul and Silas first traveled to the familiar territory of Syria and Cilicia, where people knew Paul and welcomed his teaching. Even though Luke doesn't really spend much time and tell us about it, before Barnabas had gone to get Saul from his hometown of Tarsus, Saul had been evangelizing that whole area around Tarsus, uh, that area of Cilicia that came up close to Syria. And so even before they got to the Galatian churches that he and Barnabas planted in the first missionary journey, uh, he was in familiar territory. And he was encouraging those uh, new believers in these young churches. Then they crossed over the Taurus Mountains and reconnected with those churches that we had read about in previous chapters of Acts. It says they first went to Derby, then Lystra, and then Iconium. You say, well, that, that sounds different than before. And that's correct. It's in reverse order. Because originally they had come up from the south and then traveled east. And so they would have gone to Iconium first, then Lystra, and then Derby. But now they're coming from the east, traveling west. So they hit them in reverse order. They went to Derby, and then on to Lystra, as we see in verses 1 and 2, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. 
More than likely, Lystra was the town uh, where Timothy was from. And you'll remain, remember that Lystra was the town in which Paul had been stoned and left for dead. Initially, because of a healing, the folks at Lystra wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas. They thought they were Greek gods come in the flesh. And they were ready to sacrifice uh, a, an oxen and to, uh, to worship them as gods. And they came out and said, no, 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 don't do that. We're, we're men just like you. But then the Judaizers came along and caused, stirred up trouble. And they got a mob riled up and they went and found Paul and they stoned him. They thought he was dead. But he was not. And he got up and, and he and Barnabas ended up finishing the missionary journey. Now, we're introduced to a young man named Timothy. His parents were a Jewish Christian mother and a Greek father. Now, many of the commentators uh, suggest that the way Luke writes about his father in kind of the past tense might suggest that his father had died, that his mother was a widow. Uh, we can't say that for sure, but it seems very clear that at any rate he was an unbeliever. He was a Gentile. He may well have been a Roman that married a Jewish girl and had this boy named Timothy. But while the father was an unbelieving Gentile, Timothy had a godly upbringing. We learn of this in Paul's letter uh, to, to Timothy, the second letter, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul writes, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. In that same letter later on in chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul talks about how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I know we sometimes think that the challenges of a single mom is a recent development, but it's not. Nor is the challenge of a mom bringing up kids uh, trying to raise them in a godly way but not getting any help from their spouse. Might be an unbeliever, might be uh, a believer who uh, no longer follows the Lord. And, and that's a real challenge. And here we see Timothy's mother Eunice, his grandmother Lois, uh, made sure that their boy was taught the scriptures. Now, it's unlikely that he was involved in the synagogue. We're told that he was not circumcised, probably because his father would not agree to that. But within the home, they made sure Timothy knew the word. And I just want to say to, to single moms and to mothers of children, that you are trying your best to raise them in a godly way. And you may not be getting any help from your husband. You keep on. God will bless those efforts. And you may be raising a Timothy and you don't even know it. I have the utmost respect for these two women who despite uh, differences at home, still raised a godly son. It's likely that Eunice and Lois came to Christ uh, through Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. Maybe Timothy did as well. Uh, we're not sure. He seems to be a young man at this point. In fact, if you go to uh, Paul's first letter to Timothy, which was probably written about 15 years later, he's still calling him a young man. And he's, that's what you would call somebody in their 20s or maybe their early 30s. So if you work backwards from there, Paul was probably a teenager, maybe an early teen, when he 
uh, joined up with the apostle here in Acts chapter 16. Paul had said to Timothy in, in 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one despise your youth. <laughs> and again, this is 15 years later, and Paul is still referring to him as a young man. What we do know from the scriptures is that Timothy was Paul's favorite companion and co-worker. Uh, he's described in 1 Corinthians 4.17 as, My son whom I love. In 1 Timothy 1.2, he's addressed as, My true son in the faith. As far as we know, Paul did not have any biological children. Timothy may have been that son he had always wanted but never had. He was a quality associate. He was uh, a young man with a godly character that was in large part due to the way his mother and his grandmother brought him up. And so he joins Paul as John Mark's replacement, that helper uh, that would allow Paul and Silas to focus more of their time and attention in the ministry of the word. But as we move on to verse 3 in Acts chapter 16, we're presented with what some might call a questionable action on Paul's part. Luke says, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was Greek. That might sound really, really odd. I mean, we just came off of the Jerusalem Council where Paul and Barnabas are going to bat for these Gentile believers saying they don't need to be circumcised in order to be saved. He would write to the Galatian churches that if you are circumcised, uh, Christ is of no value to you. And now he turns around and has Timothy circumcised? I mean, he used Titus as exhibit A of a Gentile believer didn't need to be circumcised, and now he's circumcising Timothy. What's up, Paul? You being wishy-washy? <laughs> you being inconsistent here? You being like a politician? No, that's not the case. Understand that Timothy, while his father was Gentile, his mother was Jewish. He had Jewish blood running in his veins. What Paul was arguing about was those who were purely Gentiles did not have to be circumcised in order to be saved. He is not suggesting that Timothy has to be circumcised in order to be saved. He wants Timothy circumcised in order to serve. Because in those days, to be a Jewish male uncircumcised meant you were an apostate Jew in the eyes of your fellow countrymen. The Jewish people of the synagogue would not have allowed Timothy in the door being uncircumcised. So how would he be able to minister with Paul, who always went to the Jews first? Remember, everywhere he would go, he'd always start in the synagogue he presented the Jewish Messiah to the Jewish people. How could he do that if Timothy couldn't come along? So this is not uh, being inconsistent in any way. He is not suggesting that Timothy had to be circumcised in order to be saved. He's doing this for future ministry. And because Timothy was, in fact, Jewish, that would be a huge stumbling block in later ministry. John Stott comments, Little minds would have condemned Paul for inconsistency, but there was a deep consistency in his thought and action. Once the principle was established that circumcision was not necessary for salvation, he was ready to make concessions in practice. What was unnecessary for acceptance with God was advisable for acceptance by some human beings. Paul taught that if one was circumcised in order to be saved, Christ was of no value. But if one is circumcised in order to be accepted by those who insist on it, then it ceases to become a ritual for salvation 
and becomes a tool for reaching the lost for Christ. Paul is having Timothy adopt his own strategy that we read about in 1 Corinthians 9.22. I have become all things to all men that I might save some. And he says, to the Jews I am a Jew, to the Greek I'm a Greek. And that doesn't mean that he is compromising his morals. It is saying, I will accommodate their convictions so that I might tell them about Jesus. That's what he's doing here. He's not going back on what he had previously taught and held. There are times when he would use his Jewish background, his Roman citizenship, his Greek culture, whatever it took to reach people for Christ, he was willing to concede on those points because nothing was more important than telling others about Jesus. I think there's an important lesson for us in this as well. Times and cultures change, but truth doesn't. We may change the methods of evangelism to reach people for Christ, but we dare not ever change the message of evangelism. We can change how we do it, but don't change what you say. Don't change the fact that sin is sin and is unacceptable to a holy God and that only through the death and of Jesus Christ on our behalf can sins be taken care of. We cannot budge on those facts. But how we present it may change. Missionaries that go to other lands may not have a worship service like we hold in America because it may not fit their culture. They may do things that we would think would be rather strange or we may not particularly care for, but that's how they do it. And in order to proclaim the truth of the gospel, we can make concessions to their culture. That is what Paul is doing here with Timothy. He's not in any way going back on the truth. He is simply making Timothy more acceptable to his fellow Jews who would have had a real problem with the fact that he had not been circumcised. So as long as the truth is not compromised, we're free to be creative. And I think we should be. As we get to know people, allow for some of their uh, scruples, you might say. Just don't compromise the truth of God's word. And as a result, Paul reports a quantitative addition in verses 4 and 5. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. What was the result of Paul and Silas and now Timothy's ministry in these churches? The churches grew The effect of their visit was to establish the churches and make them more effective in evangelizing others. Paul's missionary strategy of following up the initial evangelistic campaign with a further visit was justified. It was the right thing to do. These churches were grounded in the faith. It says they were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. They were rooted in biblical truths. Uh, Paul was able to go a little bit deeper with them. Initially, he was telling them the way of salvation. But we've got to get beyond salvation. Uh, There are some churches, that's all they ever preach. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. It's always about sin and condemnation and you've got to come to Jesus to be saved. Uh, There's nothing wrong with that. That's the truth. That's the gospel. But if you've got a church full of people who have already come to Christ, they're not growing. You're just giving them the same baby food week after week after week after week. We've got to get into the meat of the word. You've got to get past 
the uh, elementary truths of the gospel, as the writer of Hebrews said. He really got after those particular Christians. He said, you ought to be teachers by now, and someone's got to spood feed you. Grow up. And that's what Paul was doing here. He was getting them to grow in their faith, to understand more of what living for Christ is all about. A good mental image here for the Greek term used for strengthened in their faith would be a, a pre-adolescent boy filling out as muscle replaces baby fat. You know what that's like. You see a youngster start to grow and he starts to mature. That's the word used here for these churches. They're growing up in their faith. They're putting down roots in the truth. And as the churches grew stronger, they also grew larger. With depth of insight and clarity of understanding, growth inevitably follows. And I agree with Clint Gill, who 50-some years ago preached in this very church. It is a lesson desperately needed by the 21st century church, whose primary weakness is biblical illiteracy. You would be shocked to know how little the average churchgoer knows about the Bible. You would be shocked. Most of them think an epistle was the wife of an apostle. They think Moses took two of every animal on the ark. I mean, it's amazing how many people can be in church for years and yet only know the very basics of what's in the Bible. As churches, we need to grow up in our faith. We need to grow in our knowledge. You know, sometimes I'm asked, oh, why do we have to go through, you know, these old books of the Bible? Yeah, do we really need to know this? Yeah, we do. This is God's word. This is his revelation to us. It tells us about who he is. It tells us about who we are. It tells us about how he expects us to live. Now, yeah, there are some parts of the Bible, I'll admit, that maybe aren't as much uh, fun as others. Some are more challenging to see, how does this really apply to me? But it's worth the effort. Because the more we get into God's Word, the more God's Word is going to get into us. And at those times when we really need the truth, the Holy Spirit can bring that back to us. The Holy Spirit is not going to bring back to our remembrance something we've never read. <laughs> I've shared before how I went to a Christian high school. And we had teachers that would often open a class session in prayer. I had this one particular teacher that whenever we were going to take a test, she would always pray for the students as we were taking the test. That was very nice of her. I just never appreciated how she prayed for us. Because she would pray things like, Lord, bring back to the remembrance the things they studied. I didn't want that. I wanted him to somehow miraculously reveal things that I'd never know. God doesn't work that way. The truth he brings back to our remembrance is the truth we've deposited there to begin with. And that's why it's important that we regularly have a diet of God's Word, Old and New Testaments, Gospels and Epistles, history and poetry and prophecy, all of it. We need a well-balanced diet of God's Word. That's what makes strong Christians. That's what makes strong churches. Church growth should not only be measured by numbers, the New Testament says at least as much, if not more, about growing up in Christ as it does growing in size. Now, it's natural we want to see more people come to Christ. We want to see our numbers grow. I'm not saying that that's wrong. But personally, I'm not interested in a church that's a mile wide and an inch deep. We need to grow up. We need to grow deep 
And what I have found is that churches grow deep, they do grow out. And usually that's a healthier growth. I have known some churches that grow really fast, but they're not ready for it. They're not prepared for that growth. And that creates as many problems as it does solve them. We need to grow up in Christ. So nobody wants to be Wally Pipped, not even in the Christian church. But the Bible does clearly teach no one is irreplaceable in the kingdom of God. Barnabas had taken John Mark, went their way. As far as we know, they had a successful ministry. We know that John Mark went on to be used by God in a number of ways. And at the end of Paul's life, he even asked for John Mark to be brought to him by Timothy, ironically, because he was useful. Paul had taken Silas, and then they add Timothy to their group to fill the gaps. And I think it teaches us something very important. Pastors and teachers can come and go. Youth workers and uh, music leaders, they have great ministries and churches, but then they may move on as the Lord opens another opportunity. That is very natural, that is very normal in the life of a church. But the church should go on because it is the same God they worship. It is the same Lord they serve. It is the same Spirit living within them, equipping them and empowering them to do the work regardless of who's behind the pulpit or who's leading the singing or who's leading the youth. God will sometimes move people to different places in his kingdom, sometimes because he has prepared them for that particular ministry. Other times, I think it might be for the benefit of the church so that they don't become too attached to a person and they lose sight of the Lord whom they're serving. And as Paul and Silas and now Timothy move from place to place, the faces change, the, the name on the, the church changes, the name of the cities change, but one thing remains consistent. The word of God is preached. The spirit of God is at work. And the church of God keeps going and keeps growing. And that's when you know that it is truly God at work. Because he is the one that provides the growth. Paul told the Corinthians, I planted a seed. Apollos, who was another preacher that followed him, watered it. But it's God who makes things grow. He says, he that plants and he that waters, they're nothing. It's God who makes it grow. And that's an important lesson we should always remember. When it's truly the Lord's church, it's the Lord who is to be praised. It is the Lord who is to be worshipped. And it is the Lord who will continue that growth. As time passes, as faces change, it is to his honor and glory that the church of Jesus Christ goes on. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminders in your word that this is indeed your church, your kingdom, your work. We are grateful for the opportunities we have to serve. We are thankful for those gifted individuals that you bring in and out of our lives to help shape us, to help us to grow, to help us in our own service for you. But may we ever remember that you are the God of this church. Christ is the head. The Holy Spirit is our strength. May we always rely upon you for everything that is done in your body. We thank you for 
your work. We thank you for what you have done in this particular local fellowship, and we look forward to what you will continue to do until our Lord Jesus comes again to receive us unto himself. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.